and identifying that stewardship could be used um, to really further our advocacy. So um, yes, very excited to present today about what we're working on. Thanks, Kale. All right, as Kale mentioned, um, at Wyoming Wilderness Association, our mission of protecting Wyoming public wild lands um, is what drives everything that we do. And I've heard Kale describe it best, where that's kind of the seat of the stool, and then beneath it are these three strong legs of advocacy, stewardship, and education, otherwise known as our pillars. That's kind of upholding that overarching mission. And advocacy led our work for a really long time, and only um, in the more recent past has stewardship and education risen up to kind of serve equal, equally important roles within the work we're doing, and and the partnerships and efforts we're seeking out um, to drive our mission forward into the future. Um, and believe it or not, stewardship, as we've talked about already through, through NWSA, is an incredible tool for advocating for wildlands, but there's also a need to actually advocate for stewardship. Um, we have actually run into some supporters and community members who feel like stewardship is the role of our um, agency, public land agency partners and their job alone. And that in some ways us taking on some of these roles is actually um, hurting that responsibility. And WWA feels absolutely opposite to that where when it comes to protecting these lands, um, educating people on the need for us all to be stewards and then actually getting them out to do that stewardship and advocating for the importance of those things um, is foundational to the future of, of our mission, uh, protecting Wyoming public wild lands. So in our quest to figure out how we are going to not only fulfill our mission, we also realize that there are ebbs and flows within advocacy um, around, you know, NEPA processes or public land planning, um, ebbs and flows within the advocacy pillar of our organization. And we were, in addition, looking to fulfill the needs of stewardship and education. We also understood that we needed to have projects that had continuity and security and built the foundation of our work and um, sustainability as an organization. And we noticed that our agency partners um, often saw advocacy groups like ours as oppositional and kind of the other side. And we realized that we needed to overcome that barrier and not become oppositional, but become partners to the public land agencies that were really the ones that were tasked with protecting these public wild lands. So how could we support these partners? And as we started to have these conversations, we realized that there was actually a niche that needed filling. Um, but even that took some digging because when we talked to our agency partners, we actually heard some stories of, you know, when people wanna volunteer, we actually have to create projects for them. And it's more work than just doing it ourselves. And we're like, no, we need to figure out what you're actually not able to achieve and how we can fill that gap and support you in things you're already doing and take things off your plate and not add anything on it. Um, at the same time we're having those conversations, COVID-19 happened and we went into the 2020 summer and all of a sudden all of these events and all of these efforts that we had been so invested in changed significantly. And we realized not only was the niche of stewardship really important, it was also very compatible with social distancing and COVID regulations. And um, it allowed us to fully kind of embrace that as our summer focus. Um, and as I've hit on many times, um, our mission is to protect public wild lands and nothing helps someone become an advocate more than actually getting them into the wild places we're trying to protect. And um, it allowed us to educate and inform on advocacy issues, but also just how to be a responsible public land owner. And we were able to create this incredible army of supporters and enthusiastic wilderness um, advocates through stewardship and leave no trace in education as well. So as our title suggests, we wanna to present to you some stories, some success stories that help us tell um, our tale of how we've advocated for wilderness stewardship and how wilderness stewardship has allowed us to advocate for wild Wyoming. And 
in the northwest corner of the state where I am based out of our Jackson office, we um, took on a project in solitude monitoring. And I'm going to talk about how all praise the volunteer, all praise the volunteer, um, the flip side of our success, and also how um, I believe so strongly that partnerships are the answer um, within the stewardship effort. Kale, would you want to give us a little roadmap for, for your side of the state? Right, so then on the eastern side of the state over in Sheridan, kind of watching how Peggy successfully got solitude monitoring off the ground, we decided to identify, well, with our agency partners, another WSP, Wilderness Stewardship Performance Area, that they needed help with, and that was rapid campsite assessments. The uh, assessments hadn't been done since 2011, and the Cloud Peak Wilderness is pretty massive with thousands of sites to be assessed. And so we decided this would be our pilot project on this side of the state to get our volunteers up and going and using, which I'll tap into here in a minute, using the apps Survey123 and Collector. Thank you, Kale. So let's dive in to story time. So solitude monitoring, as many of us on this call know, because of the good work of the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance to kind of elevate wilderness stewardship performance as a focus for stewardship work across national forests nationwide, um, we were alerted to this need of solitude monitoring. And going back to the, the story I told of being, being informed that when I came to the forest wanting to provide volunteers, they actually had to create additional projects and more work for themselves. Solitude monitoring and wilderness stewardship performance became this obvious niche in, in the equation that we could fill because they needed to collect this data. It's generally speaking very um, straightforward and, um, and easily to train volunteers on getting out to collect this data. And for the most part, it just requires someone to go on a hike in a beautiful place and um, count encounters as they go. And um, the, the solitude monitoring protocol that we're utilizing is um, something that the Bridger Teton adopted several years ago, but it was falling on the shoulders of their wilderness rangers alone to actually collect all of this data. And they were realizing that they were just not able to collect enough of it to find significant, um, to have significant findings. And so um, it was actually through our Youth Ambassadors for Wilderness program that we started to help them gather this data. But that was a group, you know, of, you know, five to 10 students out on a backpacking trip and they were only contributing, you know, several additional data collections to an already lacking database. And when COVID hit, we actually had to cancel our in-person Youth Ambassadors for Wilderness program. And we totally shifted to making this a virtual training to bring the general public into the citizen science project. And um, it quickly went from solitude monitoring being a small puzzle piece of the Youth Ambassadors for Wilderness program to the Youth Ambassadors for Wilderness becoming a very small puzzle piece to this much greater citizen science solitude monitoring um, project. And over the course of one summer, we had 214 volunteer days across 20 data collections um, with only 72 WWA leader hours involved in all of this training. And we were able to bring in um, 1,889 total volunteer hours um, in, just a, in just one field season. And all of this data is going to continue um, to be gathered into the 2022 summer. And I feel that a success story like this helps us so much when we advocate for the need of stewardship. Look what a very small piece of our time can do for the greater um, good of these wild places. And um, as I talk to people about the success, some of those rough exteriors of, well, it's the agency's job to do this. It's not our job. We can't, we can't take this off their plate because, because it's their job, not our job. And really showing how easy it is to get citizens and in, citizens involved and then the, the benefit to our advocacy work as a result is um, a huge success story that has, that has helped us along. Some key lessons that I learned um, 
through bringing solitude monitoring to the Bridger Teton and Caribou Targhee with help obviously of the wilderness managers at those forests is that even a simple project can be filled with nuance. And so as we do these trainings, um, it's incredible all the, well, what ifs that come up and keeping track of those to inform trainings going forward to create a bulletproof um, citizen engagement plan is going to be critical. And um, we're excited to see how that will inform future trainings. Um, Solitude monitoring requires people to be in wilderness for four hours, which to me feels like no time at all, but that actually turned out to be um, a really important learning that most people who are accessing wilderness are not spending four hours there. And our volunteers were reporting on that over and over again. Um, in those 214 volunteer days, so many people came back of like, yeah, I like, you know, really had to twiddle my thumbs when I was out gathering data. Four hours is a long time, which... Um, We've, we've learned and are going to consider, but at the end of the day, it's an important chunk of time to spend out there to actually get good data. Um, even when people have been trained on a trail, maps and KMZ files are critical. People do not remember where they went on a training and um, struggle to get back there on their own. So creating all the supplies is helpful. And every volunteer wants something a little bit different. I think um, when you're dealing with you know 100 volunteers across two forests, it's amazing how many needs there are to meet. And in order to have a successful project, um, we need to figure out ways to support those people who are giving us their time. And that's a big thing that is informing our work going into the next season. And um, there's a wide variety of perceptions regarding human access and the intention of US Forest Service um, roles in all of this. As I've mentioned, people continue to say, don't do that stewardship project. You're um, just allowing the forest not to do their job. And WWA does not feel that way. We're very um, inspired by this ability to serve as a partner to our agency and push back on those people who feel that way. And the other side of this is that people couldn't believe that we were sharing these locations with the public to get people into these 20 data collections. We were saying, let's go on a hike into this zone and collect data while we're here. So you can return here and add to this database and people couldn't believe we would dare to share that place with them. And then um, last but not least, partnerships are foundation null to success. Um, we worked with Friends of the Bridger Teton, the Great Old Broads for Wilderness, and our um, national forest partners locally to make this a success. Um, and then a few quotes, I won't read them to you, but I'm just gonna leave them up here on the screen for a second for you to re read through. Um, participants loved this opportunity to get out on the trail explore new places and to feel like they were a part of taking um, taking care of these places that they loved and spent so much time. So um, really great feedback from all of the people involved. And as we mentioned, that created an army for us to continue to protect these wild places. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Kale Sentry. Thanks, Peggy. So like I mentioned at the beginning, on the other side of the state, we embarked on the wilderness stewardship performance need of rapid campsite assessments. And so um, linking up with our Forest Service partners, identifying the actual person who's gonna work with me, uh, our recreational specialist, and figuring out how we were going to um, do this pilot project for the summer. So what was great about this is that um, we got together, oh wait, go back, oh, sorry, slide back. Sorry, there, there's a Q&A open that won't go away. There we go, okay. Hmm, I cannot find, now that I'm, here we go. Right there, woo! Sorry, Kale. <laughs> That's okay. So, uh, we identified, so they've done this um, assessment before. So basically you hike in, you see where someone has camped, and there's a whole survey of what you're looking for, whether trees have been damaged, um, what the bare ground is like, if there's trash, is there, you know, human waste, all these things. So they've done this before, but we decided to use the collector and the survey one, two, three apps. And so this was different and also great at the same time, because once you learn how to do it, I could sync my map and then see, oh, someone's already assessed that campsite. So I don't need to go there. I can bypass and go somewhere else. So as we tried to figure this all out, the old data was 
a yellow dot and an orange dot. And we pretty quickly figured out that we, didn't, we needed a new color. So that was a little tripping up. So we finally got this dark red color that showed, oh, okay, that area has been assessed in 2021. Um, so getting volunteers able to use the app was tricky. Uh, but was great. And so what it ended up having to do, we thought we'd only do a couple trainings. We ended up having to do four. And kind of unlike how Peggy was able to send a lot of people out on their own, my time I ended up putting in, we led about 374 volunteer hours, um, really helping people understand how to use the app, how to get it on their phone. Phones are all different. I mean, the technology part is awesome, but then when you're out in the field helping everybody use their different phones, um, required some extra training. So, but it was awesome that we were able to, in this field season, be able to get an additional 640 individual hours of people that went out to other areas that we hadn't assessed yet, campsites. And then, so total, we had over a thousand total volunteer hours. Now this is a project since this was a pilot project that we will continue into 2022. Um, it's, it's a massive undertaking and it was just quite obvious from the Forest Service side that they needed help and uh, needed our assistance to collaborate with them to take on this project. So we were happy to fill that niche. Um, Peggy, next slide, please. So some key lessons, um, I also won't re read through all of them, but just to kind of highlight a couple so using technology, your phone, you know, these things die out in the field if you don't have a backup. And then if you didn't sync your map before you got into the wilderness area, then you weren't sure if you were assessing a place that had already been assessed. So th there was lots of little technical things, but what was great is that we had a debrief at the end of this season with a lot of our volunteers and really kind of kept what I'm going to call the pro tips. Um, for moving forward so people know how to use these apps efficiently. We're also going to provide a paper copy because honestly, even though you go out there with the best intentions with your technology, there's always something that ends up failing inevitably on one of your trips. And over here in the Bighorns to access our wilderness is a big undertaking. It's a good, it takes a lot of miles to hike to get into it. It takes driving rough roads, so which is wonderful. But if you're getting people to collect data and you're asking them to volunteer, it is that time factor too. So making sure they have a paper copy going in. Um, one great thing to hear from our volunteers is that they're all willing to do it again. They really, this whole idea of citizen science projects and something that ended up being a cool story out of this is on two different trainings, I had um, the press want to come with us. And I said, well, yeah, you can come, but you have to be trained because I want you to go back in and do this too. And it was so cool. We had our two local uh, reporters, one here in Sheridan, one in Buffalo, both went, they also went back out into the field and just that whole education of understanding land management. Oh, look, someone's camped here and wow, this is a bad site or no one's camped here. They did a great job. All these different ways that you can look at a campsite. It just, there's a lot of natural organic education that happens out there. And I know you all know that. It just was really exciting. So having reporters was a great thing that came out of this because then we got a lot of stories out of it. Um, and then the last thing I think before we go to the next slide is uh, it's really important to be proactive. I think this is pretty funny. One time I was in a, a meeting with a lot of um, agency partners and maybe some other people that work in conservation. And the, uh, the moderator was like, how many of you are extroverts? And my hand goes flying up. And I looked around the room and out of like 70 people, there were like three of us. A lot of our partners and people that work in conservation are introverted. They're out there because they love to be on their own or they want to be on the landscape. And so for us as WWA, it was really important for me to be proactive and go after not only our partner organizations, but our partner agencies, because you know they have so much going on. This is a the thing they're not thinking about too much as far as collaborating with a bunch of people like me out in the field. So that was fun. You gotta be proactive. Uh, next slide, Peg. So just a few quotes, um, and this kind of goes to what I was just saying, that top quote. So <laughs> what I hadn't even thought about this, but a participant said to me, you know, Wilderness users like us, we really like our solo time, you know, and this is great because this makes me slow down. 
I have to do a project. I have to work with these other people, but they actually have common interests. And it really was great. So I hadn't really thought about that, but a lot of people that go into the wilderness, you know, they're going out there for their solitude, obviously, but a lot of them, we don't get them together to slow down, do a project together. And that was just a, another highlight from a participant that I hadn't even really thought about. So that was kind of fun. Um, organizing them. The second one, it's, you know, people really want to give back, but you need someone to organize the crew and we're happy to do that. And it just, it does take some time, but that's a good niche that we can fill. And then the last one I think kind of flows into the stewardship advocacy part is, you know, being an organization that's been around for a long time. Um, typically, so my agency partner said to me, hey, I just want to let you know, I know that historically WWA and the Forest Service have constantly been at odds. I just think it's really great that we're working together and, you know, trying to change that. And that's great because they need to see that we're willing to get out in the field with them so that when I do comment on a proposal, they'll take us more seriously, right, in the future. So next slide. So quickly to highlight another strategy that we're doing with stewardship advocacy is we're doing a fence removal project that is adjacent to a recommended wilderness area here in the Bighorns. Um, and there, this started because there is 14 miles of downed barbed wire fence and a hunter uh, three years ago now got his horse caught in it. And this was kind of like, oh my gosh, we have got to get this fence out of here. So I got roped in and I thought, well, this is a great opportunity. It's right on the border of Rock Creek Recommended Wilderness, which we as WWA has advocated for many times. And so this is a project that we're working with a few other agencies on and getting people out there in a totally different way, but it gives us a chance to, as we're hand rolling all this barbed wire, to look across at Rock Creek and talk about these areas. And again, management, taking care of these places. Um, this has been a great project. We've only gotten a couple days out of it so far, but uh, out of those two days, we've removed two and a half miles of fence, 2000 pounds of wire that's been recycled and we 80% of it is hand rolling. So it takes a lot of time. This is a great project. We have 11 and a half miles to go and it's in really rough terrain. So we're happy to keep embarking on this. Uh, next slide, Peg. So just a few lessons about a fence removal project that's a little different. This was easier buy-in with my board and supporters. They're like, oh, because you're thinking about designate, you really want to designate that recommended wilderness next to there, right? So your board and your supporters kind of get behind that because you're doing that advocacy ask. But at the same time, we're doing a big stewardship project. So for them, this was an easier sell. Um, the agencies appreciated it because we got three different agencies that you see are represented in this picture, um, got them together. And one of them even said, you know, it's a great chance to have all three of them that work on a similar landscape to get together and work together. Again, just that common thing of slowing down, getting a group together was great. Next slide, okay. So just to wrap up here, so closing our overall kind of next steps, things that we've learned. So the Wilderness Stewardship Performance Projects, those will continue on into 2022. Uh, they're just so great. You know, once a volunteer is trained, they're on their own, they can go back. It's, it's really great to meet the needs of not only our agency partners, but our organization in upholding our mission. Um, it really helps us build rapport, not only with our agency partners, but I put, I kind of highlight or I italicize and community because, you know, a lot of people look at our advocacy group and what else are you doing besides complaining about a proposal that's happening on the land or et cetera. So this is great to advocate that we are doing things for the community. Uh, for our volunteers, never underestimate that they want to help. But even with helping, they really appreciate snacks and a hat. Some of those pictures, you know, had this hat in there. They love swag. Never underestimate volunteers and giving swag. It's really great. Um, education. It just exposes areas that it's worked. We saw uh, campsites where people are no longer camping close to water. Back in the 80s, they did this. It's, we've seen that education is working. They're not camping there anymore. Um, and we also see places where we need more education. So it kind of exposes that. Um, as far as getting our board and our other supporters, 
behind this stewardship is an advocacy tool. Um, it, time will tell if we get total buy-in, you know, uh, there is that feeling that, oh, agencies can do it. But I think between the pandemic and increased visitation to our Wyoming landscapes, I think we're getting there. I think they see the need that we need to be out on these landscapes in that way. So our next steps is we'll just get better at recruiting volunteers. We'll get better at sharing these stories of impact. And hopefully this will just enhance our recruitment um, of future volunteers collaboration and just kind of launch us into the future to use this tool really for promoting advocacy of these wild landscapes. Wyoming can use it and I know other places can too. So we're excited to be involved in this project. Thank you so much. I know that we're doing questions later, but uh, there's my email up on the screen. If you have specific questions or you're coming to Wyoming and you want to engage in these volunteer efforts, let us know. So thanks so much, you guys. Great opportunity to uh, present here today. Peggy, any, any final words? No, I feel like Kale wrapped it up beautifully. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to present. You did one, yeah. This, that was a wonderful presentation. Lots of good uh, examples um, and some really good best practices. So thank you very much. And yeah, we'll do the, there's two questions in the queue right now. And we'll get to those towards the end. So, Phil, you're up. Okay. Let me see if I can. Uh, it says hostess disabled screen sharing. So, can you re enable it? Yes, yeah, it's on it right now. Okay. Uh, still not getting, still not able to. Okay. There we go. Get to the right view here. All right. So uh, I'm Phil Huff with the Friends of Scotchman Peaks Wilderness, and I'm here to talk today about how we've really integrated advocacy and stewardship so that they are um, inseparable. And our estimation, they walk the path towards wilderness together. <clears throat> Our mission is to pass on a Scotchman Peaks Wilderness for our children and grandchildren. We do that by bringing together thousands of folks from Idaho and Montana from all walks of life so that we can leave a legacy of wilderness protection. It's through strong grassroots that support that we will get there. We have three main goals, congressionally designated wilderness for the Scotchman Peaks to permanently protect it as the gold standard of conservation, to build a community that values conservation and wilderness through education, outreach and boots on the ground experiences. Again, we're gonna talk about how all of those are really interrelated. And to, through this, nurture and train a diverse, dedicated group of community leaders, grassroots supporters, who are both good stewards and strong advocates for wilderness. So I'll start for those who aren't familiar with, where are the Scotch and Peaks? Oops, slide too fast. I wanna show you here at the northeast edge of Lake Ponderé, to the west of the Cabinet Mountains, which was part of the 1964 Wilderness Act. And since 1964, no new wilderness areas have been established in Northwestern Montana and none north of the Locksaw River in Idaho. All of the light green is national forest lands, suitable for wilderness in many cases and suitable for timber production. And it's largely been through the decades that the two have squared off with each other. That's not been true now for over 20 years, but still we have no wilderness. We're going to talk about how to get there through stewardship and how that works with outreach education, collaboration, and advocacy. So here we are a little bit closer up. For those who want to zoom in, you can see that the Scotch and Peaks sits astride the Idaho-Montana border in the far north part of both states. Again, I want to go back to this uh, quadrant of techniques that many nonprofits use and really talk about how they're all almost inseparable from each other, at least the way we apply them. And I think for groups who want to be effective, that's the main way to go. It's, it's hard to achieve a nonprofit mission working towards wilderness preservation, whether it's an existing area through stewardship without advocacy. Uh, and it's hard to advocate for a new area effectively without stewardship, in my opinion. Let's step back, though, and take a look at the why wilderness. It's for people who want to get out there and enjoy it. As President Johnson said, we must leave a glimpse of the world as it was in the beginning. 
he was a very visionary or someone was a very visionary person who wrote that for him. It capitalized on Howard Zonheiser's work over the years, who saw it as part of this continuum, the wilderness that has come to us from the eternity of the past. We have the boldness to project into the eternity of the future. In its very most basic form, the wilderness system was created with a little over 9 million acres, but it was intended in Howard's eyes and in President Johnson's eyes to create an enduring legacy that's written into the Wilderness Act. We can't really have an enduring legacy of wilderness for our country on only 9 million acres. That was the down payment. That was the promise of the start of the process to get there. But to do so, we must have good public support at the heart of any public policy, if it's going to be lasting through the ages, which is the perpetuity of wilderness, there must be strong public support. And that starts with really building that chorus of advocates. I heard yesterday, uh, some folks from the agency talking about how as agency people, they don't have a role in it. I would push back on that a little and suggest that the very earliest days from Bob Marshall forward, agency people were at the heart of the wilderness movement. Aldo Leopold was at the heart of the wilderness movement. We need strong advocates both inside the agency and outside the agency. They both have different roles in their advocacy, but without either, we won't get very far forward in either protecting the wilderness areas that we have now or bringing in additional areas to really fulfill that vision of an enduring system of wilderness. So taking a look at a snapshot in time from just before the Wilderness Act in 1940, these were roadless areas in northwestern Montana. By 1975, the dark green represents the remaining roadless areas. By 1999, the so-called year that the roadless rules promulgated, we're down to this much. I want to show this area up here. This is the Scotchman Peaks in Montana, one of the last largest and wildest places in northwestern Montana which is still in that dark green, suitable for wilderness. If we don't take action soon, the areas will all continue to shrink further, whether through road development or encroachment of non-conforming uses, as we heard about yesterday. Both will diminish the wilderness characteristics, which still persist and which make it eligible and important that we save these places. Terry Tempest Williams brings it all together. If you know wilderness in the way you know love, you would be unwilling to let it go. Our role is to really connect people with the passion that's in their heart for these wild areas, because it's only really in finding those points of entry in finding what makes someone passionate about an area that they will step up as an advocate or a steward or ideally both. And oftentimes the path is through first becoming an advocate and then seeing how an individual can shape and do boots on the ground or important work to steward it. And sometimes it's through bringing them in as a steward because there's something about that that they really enjoy. And then they see the wilderness values <clears throat> and become passionate advocates. We want them to find their own wild place. So that in this case, Bree can jump for joy on or near the summit of Scotchman Peaks. And for other people, what's in their hearts? Are they angling or the hunting? And in this case, it's Ron and Laura Forsberg. They believe in areas where nature is allowed to run its course. They want to have those areas that they can enjoy. It's partly about preserving habitat, but it's preserving our connections to those habitat needs. Our 2020 scholarship winner from Libby High School, Young Ryan, is privileged to grow up on non-motorized, non-mechanized trails where he can pick huckleberries, he can hunt during the late uh, fall, and he can snowshoe in the winter. It's about connecting young people with the areas that are important to them and gaining their acceptance and knowledge that they can do something about it. It's about Rebecca Sanchez and her homeschooled kids getting them out every week of the year in some backcountry adventure, often in the Scotch and Peaks, so that they're free to roam. They can explore and enjoy nature just as it is out there. And so for them, it's about a very personal experience. It's about their growth and development. We bring that to our stewardship work by recognizing that stewardship isn't just the traditional trails stewardship. It's also about creating these experiences. It's about conducting citizen science with wildlife, habitat preservation, it's about education. It's about educating our youth so that they understand and educating our communities so that they understand both the need and value and what they can do to help and enhance wilderness characteristics of the area now while it's still waiting designation and even afterwards. We know that once it's designated, there will still need to be work done to preserve these characteristics. 
So I want to dive into some of the ways we've done that and hopefully through this, try to connect them with the things that they may not seem like they're like. Hikes might seem like a normal extension of an outreach program, but they're really about a way of connecting people to an area so that they become passionate about it. So it's not just an abstract idea or even a slide on a screen. It's about taking youth out who might be troubled or in crisis, who are in a shelter because their home has been disrupted. They might not have the opportunities ordinarily to get out into public lands or nature or call the back country or wilderness. We want to connect them so that they can have value in their lives as they grow and develop. It's about getting our county commissioners out, two of them in this photo in 2015, and they made the banner that proclaims Scotchman Down, Down, Bonner County's love for the Scotchman Peaks and hiked up there with us, with the district ranger, with a couple of news people, with advocates from all backgrounds. That is a form of hiking, outreach, and advocacy all in, its, in one unified form, which I would suggest is probably the best thing we could have done in 2015 to provide good stewardship for the area. Of course, there's the traditional trails stewardship, which most people in this group are familiar with. It's the crosscut saw. Yes, it's training people on the use of traditional tools so that once the area is designated, we have a core of skilled volunteers. And in this case, it doesn't hurt that the woman on the left is one of our grants officers from a community foundation, not one that necessarily ordinarily funds trails work per se, but they fund community development work. So getting her out there to see what this is all about uh, really creates a lasting bond with that community foundation that helps assure to some degree our capacity to do this work in the future. We started down the role of this traditional approach to trail stewardship in 2010 when we had an aha moment, a huge blowdown of trees in the fall, left the tangle that was hard for hikers to get through. The Forest Service crews were almost through for the season. We scheduled four days in June with our district recreation officer, put out a small request for volunteers and had 17 people show up and cleared everything out in one day. And all of a sudden we realized there was pent up demand that people we had developed as passionate advocates wanted to do something, they wanted to give back. And while we were waiting for wilderness designation, we had a way that we could put them to work so they would become even more engaged and even more passionate when the time came to write the letters to get a strong forest plan recommendation and to get legislation introduced. Our first summer of 2011, we did four projects. We hired a part-time summer intern. She pulled together a number of people from all backgrounds. One of the wonderful things about trails work is people who might be reluctant to come out to an event for an advocacy group are more than willing to come out and swing a Pulaski. And it's perhaps because they are not those extroverts. It also is perhaps because they are cautious about whose company they keep. We have found some of our most dedicated, passionate stewardship volunteers, trail stewardship volunteers, to be some of the most conservative people in our communities. That's helped us broaden the base of support in, in measurable ways. We've had the intern program every year since, except for last year, well, year and a half ago with COVID. We've turned it into an opportunity for the intern here from Gonzaga on our left to also do outreach work, to go to places to demonstrate the tool techniques, to develop support in the community for this kind of work, to develop an understanding of why it's important, why we do it, and why it's necessary that it be done, and why without a group like ours doing 19 trail project days in an 88,000 acre area this summer, trails wouldn't be open or wouldn't be as accessible. Of course, we take those cross-country saws into the back country. Uh, I want you to note the non-bridged crossing here. We do try to maintain the trails. We do maintain the trails to a backcountry wilderness standard. We keep them open. In some cases, that means doing some knees on the ground work like Sandy is doing here, uh, or swinging a Pulaski or a multi-tool as we dig a lot of dirt. We had a major blowout on this particular watershed and had to create a quarter mile new trail just to get around a cliff face that had sloughed off, lest the trail be closed to the interior part of the Scotchmans. We train the next generation, literally bringing up young stewards in our community so that they understand the value of putting time in this kind of work, not just to their development, but to the way that they can impact the community. We've had a great opportunity with a board member, former board member now, who is a retired nurse. She got trained and certified to teach wilderness remote first aid through the Red Cross and has done that as a volunteer now for seven years. We at this point have certified over 75 people. We focused first on our project leaders and then all of our volunteers. Uh, we can do this at a very low cost. 
and give them the opportunity to get a very low cost certification. I wanna step back and urge that not all streams need to be bridged. We do need to show some restraint at times in the work that we do to provide for those primitive opportunities. And yet at the same time, we aren't traditionalists. I know there'll be some of this group who will gasp at the idea of leaving a lookout tower like the Star Peak in the wilderness area. It's proposed that way. There are options in writing legislation to recognize its historical value. There is a need to let it continue to exist for the community. The bottom structure is the oldest structure on the Kootenai Forest. It was built by Ranger Granville back in 1906. The lookout tower was deteriorating about 10 years ago. The effort to stabilize it was, uh, the, the Forest Service requested our help at efforts to stabilize it. We engaged the nine mile mule team to show this could be done with traditional methods. We got students from the University of Missoula to come out and help unload the mules and carry uh, the lumber up there. And we recognized all of our volunteers as we did with uh, this four-legged one with our volunteer hat. Volunteer recognition is important to any successful stewardship program. About that same time, the Forest Service hydrologist working on a road system right outside the proposed wilderness area was reclaiming a road and wanted our help to plant 3,000 white pine seedlings. We thought that would be a lot of fun to go play in the mud. And we did just that. We looked at this as an opportunity to enhance the ecosystem immediately around the Scotchman Peaks and in doing so to help provide some of the habitat integrity for both flora and fauna and thus enhance the wilderness characteristics of the area we were trying to protect, we are trying to protect. And had the opportunity to engage another four-legged volunteer to carry some of those white pine seedlings. We go all out to find a job for everyone. Same year in the fall, we had another aha moment uh, when the lead biologist for non-game animals for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game approached us and asked our help in setting up some camera bait stations in the West Cabinets. He had been collecting data at the Selkirks for a couple of years nearby, didn't have the manpower, but had the equipment. We put a whisper out and got 15 people to come out in the winter to snowshoe in to help set up a couple of those bait stations. It was such a wonderful outpouring of support that the following year, uh, we got a small grant to hire a winter coordinator and we started the process of setting up over the course of four years, 70 different tracking stations and what we affectionately called the Greater Scotchman Peaks ecosystem, the West Cabinet Mountains. Looking primarily for Wolverine, Fisher, Martin and Lynx, the four endangered species of interest to the state of Idaho to develop wildlife conservation plans uh, so that they could frankly keep them off the threatened and endangered species list, or in the case of the lynx, do the right thing they needed to do. What we found was a lot of people were interested in wildlife. They didn't know much about wilderness. They hadn't yet become supporters, but they were really turned on by the prospect of studying for these critters and what they could do to help. So we had a tremendous outpouring of support for that. Over the course of the four years, we engaged almost 300 unique volunteers of which about 200 of them were first time friends of the Friends of Scotchman Peaks. So people came, as we like to say, for the Wolverines and they stayed for the wilderness. We found a lot of the Mustelids. They come out at night, they're attracted by the bait, they are shy in the day, and most people rarely get to see a fisher, uh, much less a Wolverine. Uh, and we had hundreds of photos of fishers, enough to show that there was a population of fishers in the West Cabinet Mountains of over three dozen individuals where it had thought they had been extirpated. This led to some really interesting results that have helped enhance conservation efforts in the area around the, the Scotchman Peaks and including the Scotchman Peaks. The biologists also got a lot of what they called gravy data. They weren't going after red fox, but found images of red fox, which are fairly rare in North Idaho. Found images of flying squirrels, this particular night, eight different squirrels were attracted to the bait station at one time. Squirrels were thought to be relatively thin across the landscape, but we actually found uh, more squirrels at more stations than any other species of animal we found. And then there's the cats, the media sensations of the world. Everyone loves a good link story, including our local print media. When we found the bobcat and posted that to our Facebook page, it just blew up with uh, almost record number of shares for us at the time. Cats and the internet. You can't go wrong in publicizing a stewardship program if you can find a way to work those in together. As for benefits, 
we benefited work that the agency was doing for winter travel planning, for forest land management plans, for the Idaho Department of Fish and Games uh, state action wildlife plans. All of those things provide for long-term stewardship of the wilderness characteristics of the areas. This data would have been almost impossible for fish and game on their own to collect. It is an integral part of stewardship to look at how we can conduct citizen science and collect research data. For us, we also involved new community partners, new organizations, and new volunteers, as I've already touched on. And I think very importantly for advocacy, it was at that moment in time that our congressional delegations really understood we weren't the organization that was suing or litigating the Forest Service over road closures or fish and game or wolf habitat. We were the group that was trying to help them achieve their missions. And from the standpoint of building political power, that's very important to be identified as a willing and helpful partner. For some of our volunteers, it was just simply a matter of going out and having fun. And at the end of the day, if people aren't having fun, they can forget their passion. And then when you need them to step up, they're not there. We also engaged a large number of students through several schools. This particular group from the alternative high school locally is going out to check a station. They're learning about the science behind this kind of monitoring. And then we'd go back into the classrooms to look at the camera results and talk to them about their role in it. That led to some ongoing relationships with schools and to a really engaged group of volunteers who have been trained on all of this. The following year, Fish and Games said after four years of data, they have enough, too much, no more. Uh, so we took all that energy and we channeled it into what we call our Winter Tracks Youth Education Program, where we take students out on field days in the winter uh, at local venues so that they can go through a module of stations and identify different resources. One of our most popular is our Winter Tracks Tree ID, uh, where they go out and literally get to experience trees in a new way and be able to learn more about them and identify them. And, Again, coming back to engaging volunteers who cross the spectrum, we have on the left here, Jeff Pennick, retired Forest Service civil culturalist who after almost three decades with the agency lives locally and just wants to share his passion for trees. And on the right, we have Ed Robinson, who had been the area supervisor for the Idaho Department of Lands. And anyone who does work in Idaho uh, will immediately know the Idaho Department of Lands is not one that's usually connected with conservation. They're usually connected with a mission to cut timber for maximum profit for schools. But that doesn't mean the individuals in there aren't very well experienced that don't care. Ed has become one of our mainstays of our program. He's taught nearly every Winter Tracks class for the last five years and is now proudly a board member of ours. He's also a very accomplished en plein air art painter. Uh, if you ever see one of our en plein air art programs, you'll see more of Ed's work. We connect people like uh, retired nurses, uh, active veterinarians with specialties that they're interested in, anatomy, physiology, mammal adaptation. This particular approach has proven to be so popular that we've carried it through our mammals trunk to other educational opportunities. We've engaged the students, of course, and the teachers. Teachers in small rural towns are sometimes, oftentimes, very respected public spokespeople. And so by engaging them at a level of the program where Becky Haig will talk about how lucky they are to have the expertise of our volunteers and how it's helped shape her kids, these are statements that carry back home to the parents. We don't proselytize during these events. We don't talk necessarily directly about the Scotch and Peaks, but we focus in on the wilderness values and things that they can take home to help perhaps just open up the eyes of a few family members. The beauty of schools is it cuts across almost all political, social, economic lines. So if you can engage students and through them their families, then you're delving deeper into the community than you might otherwise. Last year with COVID, hands-on learning was a very difficult thing. So we transitioned to a hybrid online model uh, with the Zoom meetings and sent trunks ahead of time with things that the teachers could use with their students before, during, and after the class. They could make tracks with, they could plant seeds, uh, they could make a compass. And then we brought the resource specialists in to talk with them and do an interactive Zoom dialogue. And it worked well for the pandemic. We're all looking forward to getting back outside uh, we did do one class as schools opened up in April, uh, masked up, COVID, and safe distanced. And we look forward to a full return this winter to our winter tracks. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, have taken our mammals trunk around to fairs and festivals as a great 
outreach tool, but this is where outreach is part of the education that is really a focus of the stewardship work to create the local support needed for long-term advocacy. And so it's hard for us in our work to really separate things and say specifically, one action is entirely separate from the other. We've taken groups out on field trips to look at fire ecology. Uh, and again, led by authoritative people like Jeff Pennick and Art Zach, if anyone's done fire ecology work in the Northwest, you'll recognize him and getting him out to engage local folks in conversations about what it does and doesn't mean. With our timber partners, Doug Bradadich, featured here is one of the senior managers at Idaho Forest Group. And here he is with a group of kids out in the trees uh, on a field day trip in May. We want to collaborate with our forest service partners. We also want to engage them in our work. Again, deepening the level of their commitment and our ability to integrate with the community. One of the programs we've developed out of all of this is our trail ambassador program. We do that to keep mountain goats wild, hikers safe and trails open. In 2015, we had an unfortunate incident where a mountain goat gored an individual who was too close to it. It's because they really like salt. Hikers encourage them to lick them, and then the goats don't understand why another hiker won't. We try to educate the public that this is a bad idea. We did it first with traditional media work, with this cartoon drawn by one of our supporters. Put that up on a poster. We put more signs up at Treeline alerting people to the fact they need to be, be cautious around goats, give them a good distance, make sure they stay their distance. When that didn't work, we deployed trail ambassadors. We have just finished our sixth season. We put them out on weekend days and holidays from early June to early October, usually employ or engage about 30 to 40 volunteers. They talked to over a thousand hikers each summer. This uh, last summer, uh, during the summer of COVID, the peak day was about 147. This last summer was about 90. We know this is a way to meet people where they are by engaging volunteers in something they'd like to do anyway, hike up to the top of Scotchman Peak and see goats. Who doesn't want to do that? And <clears throat> we can collect good data. We can help influence behavior. We send some of them out with loppers. And if you ever want some real lopping done, you send an 11 year old kid out. No one's gonna say no to him. And also he's gonna get a lot of brush cut back. Um, so we have found ways to try to pull all of this work together. Another excellent uh, showcased opportunity for how we engage our partners, both our agency partners with Idaho Fish and Game who provide training support for this for uh, the Forest Service who has provided some monetary support and also interacts with us on the information and data we collect. The local chapter of the Idaho Master Naturalists, our Native Plant Society, and this last summer with some COVID relief funding from our local community foundation in Novia and the National Education Environmental Foundation. It's great when you can partner with organizations like that. Uh, we did traditionally some work with the Treasured Landscape, which was a program set up by the National Forest Foundation a few years back. They designated the Lightning Creek area, one of the treasured landscapes. And we did some white bark pine restoration work in there over the course of three summers. We surveyed 3,000 acres. We did tree counts to look for diseased trees. We did habitat uh, analysis to see where they might do prescribed burning. We did rare plant surveys to see where they shouldn't do prescribed burning. All of this led to the ability for the agency to collect the data they needed to implement good plans. We partnered with the backcountry horsemen um, here, Randy would be very happy to see that. Dale Shrimp with his horses out there, engaging our hikers with a little bit of resupply. The fires came, prescribed burning wasn't as necessary because fires did what they should do, but we uh, moved immediately to seed sowing and seedling planting. Uh, and again, I just like to throw this one in because where the horsemen couldn't go or wouldn't go, we had water sherpas carry up a stash for people to spend several days up there. There's something for everyone. So it was a great project by the numbers real quickly again, 25 unique volunteers. We surveyed 35 miles of trails, 25 miles of habitat, square miles of habitat, including three uh, plant surveys at high alpine lakes. People came for those rare plants. Some come to help out for the weeds, Noxious Weed Training Day. You can identify that thistle through this guidebook, which we put together with the assistance of two volunteers who have great expertise in weeds and created a area specific weed guidebook for folks to use to go out and monitor for the presence of weeds to help the agency develop a plan to eradicate them. I wanna talk briefly about collaboration. We heard about that yesterday. 
I think most people agree that that's a necessary precursor to developing a broad-based bill. It is not new. Senator Frank Church recognized in 1977 that as he worked for wilderness for more efficient uh, forest management, because the only way we can fashion an adequate wilderness system is as part of a well-balanced resource management program for our entire country. Frank Church is often recognized as being the father of the area that carries his name in Idaho. He was also a very well-balanced and early collaborator. Those efforts come through today, to the Panhandle Forest Collaborative, which I sit on, the Kootenai Forest Stakeholders, which we also sit on, and in 2010, the collaborators came together with a common ground understanding of support for a forest plan that included timber production and wilderness from all sides, timber and environmentalists. This work continues as we develop a stakeholders agreement for the Kootenai that will encompass timber, recreation, and wilderness, and recognize that we have partners immediately outside of those areas from Hecla Mining. Their reclamation of the Troy Mine is going to include a thousand acres of conservation futures for areas that they've reclaimed that will help create connectivity between the West Cabinets and Cabinets. So the work that we do has an impact even outside. It culminated in 2015, taking our president of the Chamber of Commerce to go to DC to advocate for wilderness. As Bill Hodge touched on earlier, uh, it is important in the agency to work ground level up so that each rung isn't surprised by the one below it. It's also important in working with Congress to make sure your local staffers are well aware of anything before the DC legislative aides are, before the member is. Nobody wants to be surprised. And also you want to build that support from the bottom up from those folks in the congressional offices most familiar with the area. Even doing that, Congress is very deliberate. They move very slow. We did, uh, I did attend the Boulder White Cloud hearing in 2015. That's Senator Risch in the background. He's deliberating on the bill. Eventually that did pass a couple months later. And at that hearing, he also said he was gonna tee up the Scotchman Peaks next. So a year later, after he promised that, we took uh, Terry Kelly, our Bonner County uh, Commissioner, conservative Republican, and Bob Bay from Idaho Forest Group, a senior vice president there back to DC to remind him of that pledge and to encourage him to introduce a bill, which he did in late 2016. Hey, Phil, I hate to truncate such a good program, but can you, okay. this, this is sure. wonderful, it really is wonderful, yep. but can you, can you close in about a minute, please? Yep, I sure can. All right, so thanks. That all comes to advocacy, which uh, again, coming back to our most passionate, persuasive advocates were those who have been with us on all those programs all along, and they really worked the phones. So I think there's just a couple slides left there. We are still back at it. These things take time and patience. We're working on a landscape proposal, both for Idaho in the north and for the northwestern part of Montana. In each case, it would include the Scotch and Peaks as one of the featured wilderness areas. It would also take into account timber interests and recreation needs. You can support, anyone can support by becoming a friend. We have over 10,000 friends today. Subscribe online to either our weekly insider or our three times a year peak experience. Online, you can also listen to our podcasts. And I'll leave it at that with Wilderness Answers, the eternal questions. And for all other questions, we can wait till the end or you can contact me or any of our staff through our website or our Facebook page. Fantastic, Phil. And you are the podcast host. Uh, well, that's another wonderful example, really peppered with lots of good best practices and, and lessons learned. So thank you very much for that. Um, again, we'll do the, the question and answer at the end here. Renee, we're going to turn to you now. Great. Thank you. Thanks, I'm just going to get my slides loaded here. Um, thanks for having me today. I am Renee Patrick, part of the stewardship team at the Oregon Natural Desert Association. Um, we are an environmental conservation organization that was founded in 1987 to protect, defend, and restore high desert landscapes in Eastern Oregon. The onset of the global pandemic in 2020 certainly upended our traditional model of leading group trips of volunteers to do important on the ground work to steward our landscapes in Eastern Oregon. For over 30 years, ONDA has been taking volunteers out into the desert, not only to accomplish important restoration projects, but to help those volunteers connect to place 
see firsthand the importance of intact habitats and healthy ecosystems and help them understand the greater context of our stewardship work in the realm of advocacy. Many of the traditional ways we would involve our stewardship participants in advocacy would be to have an in-depth session around the campfire at night to discuss certain pieces of legislation we are working on. For example, permanent protection of places like the Waihee Canyonlands or the recently introduced Sutton Mountain National Monument proposal along Oregon's John Day River. We would also give volunteers a deeper dive into the pressing issues across the sagebrush sea, like greater sagebrush habitat or the beaver's role in helping to mitigate climate change impacts in desert creeks and rivers. We would write postcards to public land decision makers, help volunteers understand how to comment in the public planning processes, and identify opportunities for our stewardship volunteers to take an active role in the management of public lands. Going into the 2020 stewardship season, we had a full slate of group stewardship trips planned. Typically, we hold between 30 and 40 trips with over 500 volunteers to do things like build beaver dam analogs, remove obsolete barbed wire fence, and maintain trails in wilderness areas in Eastern Oregon. Because of the pandemic, we canceled or rescheduled all of our trips, then canceled those rescheduled trips again until we realized we just would not be holding any group trips in 2020. During that time, we developed COVID protocols and interfaced with other stewardship groups in Oregon and beyond to discuss how other programs were managing. ONDA had an existing independent sewage program that was started in 2015, but it was small and had traditionally not been terribly effective um, as a part of our stewardship offerings. I was tasked with redesigning the program in late 2019 to try and make it more impactful and effective. So when the pandemic continued into last fall, about the time we would start planning our 2021 stewardship season with our agency partners, it was clear we had no idea what the next year would bring. So we decided to make the ISP program the only opportunity for volunteers in 2021, but a lot hinged on redesigning it to make the systems automated and impactful without physical opportunities for training and education. The first step in developing a new version of the program was for the stewardship team to meet with our ONDA conservation and legal staff to explore with them the stewardship activities that would help further our conservation campaigns, defend our legal work, and help make a real difference in the ecological outcomes across the desert. We also had to look at the work uh, that we were already committed to doing with our partners and figure out if we could adapt it to a model where volunteers would be on their own doing the work. After that process, we had about 40 different project ideas that came out of those discussions and we went through a prioritization process to whittle the list down to about 20 projects that we would develop throughout the year. Next, we had to figure out what technology we would be using for the work and how to educate our volunteers about those, those options. I had been using the app Gaia GPS for years as a long distance hiker, and we decided to explore that platform to give our volunteers a useful navigation and data collection tool. Traditionally, Onda had been using Avenza, but there were limitations with that platform especially in regards to navigating in off trail or road areas. We used our Gaia GPS Onda team account where each project had a unique account that would be shared among that project's volunteers. Data like waypoints, route options, and maps to use while out of cell service were loaded into each account. And while on the project, any additions of waypoints or tracks a volunteer added would be visible by all project participants in real time. We learned about the Colorado Mountain Club's Recreation Impact Monitoring app last year at this conference, the Wilderness Stewardship Alliance Conference, when Julie Mock from CMC gave a presentation. We were excited to figure out how it could be used in our program after learning CMC wanted to expand beyond Colorado. So explored the idea with several of our Oregon BLM district partners and worked with the Oregon Washington National Conservation Lands Program Lead, Lauren Padot, and the state BLM GIS lead to develop a custom assessment for WSA monitoring. 
So when the volunteers are on this project and using RINs, uh, it automatically populates an ArcGIS online map that both the BLM district and we have access to. Problem issues that might need immediate attention by the agency are highlighted. And each observation can include one or more photos that our volunteers took of the impacts they are observing. A dashboard view of the information also gives the BLM and us an overview of all the data that has been collected and is another way to sort and filter through the volunteer observations. The real-time information has greatly improved the efficiency of our WSA monitoring program that had traditionally been paper-based. We also use RINs in areas that have been heavy hit with COVID outdoor recreation impacts like the Elvor Desert and Steens Mountain Wilderness. So next in the process, uh, this is real-time look at my brain trying to figure all this out. Um, was, was how do we build the framework? So each project, we decided to have a password protected page on our website. So only those volunteers invited to the specific project would be given access. We filmed and edited videos from ONDA staff and agency staff about the importance of our work and how the data the volunteers collected would be used. So even without being able to interact one-on-one -on -one with our volunteers, we could still have that FaceTime through these videos. We also created training videos about how to use the technology and tools on the project and created forms and videos to cover things like the job hazard analysis and tailgate safety talk. Then we developed detailed maps and information about access, responsible recreation, safety considerations, and as 2021 progressed, and Oregon experienced triple digit temperatures and fires in our area, we added important information about monitoring during fire season and extreme heat. We even offered to print and mail colored maps to anyone that didn't have access to a color printer. For some of the projects, we even created story maps to help illustrate the work in our projects. And I'll go ahead and launch this one. Hopefully, it's going to show up. So this is a story map that is on our um, project page for the Teens Mountain Wilderness Trail Monitoring. Um, this is one we developed an adoptive mile program for about 40 miles of trail in the Teens Mountain Wilderness, some of that overlapping with the Oregon Desert Trail. And so through the story map, we're able to show in real time um, in detailed maps, you know, where the trails are, help people understand if which mile they chose, how they would access it, where it is in the landscape. Um, this is a, a scale out view of different access points. It's loading a little slowly for me today. But so we were able to use these story maps to really illustrate and get to um, show volunteers what to expect, where to go before they leave home and decide how they're gonna monitor or where they're gonna go for this project. So let me go back. So back to the project page, we included information about how to submit a report at the conclusion of the project and how to upload the data that was collected. We even have a section called desert bathing where we encourage volunteers to spend some time developing their personal connection to the desert. Next, we included forums on some of our project pages so volunteers could communicate among themselves on things like access issues and on the ground conditions. The goal was to create a community for each project, even when they would be doing the work on their own. The most important part of this whole process was to automate it as much as possible. We didn't know if 50 volunteers would be interested in the program or 500. So we needed a system that could scale with demand and without a lot of staff time. We used a program called Form Assembly to build out our volunteer interest form and reporting form. These two forms gathered important information like, um, do you have access to a high clearance four wheel drive vehicle? 
Are you comfortable driving on remote two-track roads? And then how long are you willing to hike? How are you, what kind of camping, or do you not want to camp? And then on the reporting form, we include things like recording the hours, the work done, and a spot to give us feedback, submit stories and photos. And so both the responses from both of these forms were automatically added to our database, which is Salesforce, where we manage all of the, our membership information. So the most time intensive part of the system was building and using a master spreadsheet to match volunteers to projects. We wanted to be able to see their skills and abilities and pair them to the appropriate project. For example, if I had a volunteer in Portland who didn't have access to a four wheel drive car and could only volunteer on the weekends, I wouldn't send them to the far southeastern corner of the state on really rough roads. It would take just a day of driving to get there. So this was the most time consuming part of the process and I was essentially acting as an air traffic controller. But that attention to volunteer preferences, skills, project demands and personal limitations was very important. Also the spreadsheet and detailed tracking we did helped us achieve our goal of asking every interested ISP volunteer to participate in at least one project. I wanted to be able to track who we asked for what and when. In an effort to communicate the accomplishments of the program throughout the year, we updated a notes from the field page where we would share monthly accomplishments, photos, and quotes from the volunteers. Next, we developed some incentives. Once a volunteer had filled out the reporting form, they were entered to win some raffle items from some of our business partners. And we tried to make it fun and relevant with an Instagram feed, hashtag independent onda, um, to this, which would feed the photos into our notes from the field page. So the implementation field, we launched the new program in late February this year. Um, we also had a video that we put together sort of trying to explain the expectations for people, um, what it would look like and give people some of that face-to-face -face time. I'll play a little bit. So that's, that's just a little taste of, <laughs> of our video. And for time's sake, I'll, I'll continue on. Um, so these are the projects that we launched throughout the year. Things like LEC monitoring, grazing monitoring, road monitoring, WSA monitoring, trail monitoring, um, lots of different projects. Uh, so it was a lot of work throughout the year. And we're still out there. Some of our volunteers are still doing some of this work. So the program to date, since then we've had over 450 volunteers register for the program and we've asked almost all of them to participate in at least one project. Some have gone out in more than one project. Volunteers have contributed over 2000 hours to these projects and now we have massive amounts of data that have come in throughout the year. Much of that data will help us develop future on the ground stewardship projects, will inform how the ISP project evolves next year um, and is creating the basis for several legal documents on issues and topics we are currently engaged in. At this stage, we have such a large amount of information and process that we hired an intern this fall to help us with the task and give them some data processing and GIS experience. Throughout the process, we've embedded advocacy information in the projects, again, trying to help the volunteers understand the full context for how their monitoring or stewardship on the ground impacts the larger efforts to protect or restore certain habitats. We also have a robust database of what volunteers spent time in what areas and on what issues so that when we have a specific ask or need for public input, we can look to our members for spent time on the ground in these places and have some of the context and know that they have some of the context to make informed and impactful comments when needed. 
We plan to circle back with the volunteers who have gone out on each project and explain how we are using their data and how we are taking action on that information. Our hope is that many of the same volunteers will head out on the same projects next year and come to know these places intimately and see the changes over time. So some learnings that have come throughout the process this year. One, the project pages are so dense with information that often the questions we get have been addressed in the content we provided. So in essence, I've learned that people don't read everything thoroughly. Um, I'm not sure how to solve that problem, but we've added a final section to the project pages that provides a form for them to indicate if they have understood the directions and process or gives them an opportunity to ask us any follow-up questions. We also include information right on top of the page that mentions simply reading and watching all the videos count towards their volunteer hours. So please take the time needed to review the page entirely. Um, the initial excitement of the 470 plus volunteers that have signed up for our program, almost all of them have been asked to participate in at least one project, but only 170 have actually gone out, done the work, filled out the report. Granted, we have had some unusual, or maybe the new usual, conditions this year as the large bootleg fire started near our field area in early June, closing down one project altogether. And smoke impacts affected many other project areas as well. Temperatures of almost 120 degrees also hit in June, creating unsafe conditions and other fires throughout the summer caused closures or impacts. One BLM district explicitly asked volunteers to avoid monitoring for almost three months this year due to the safety concerns of the extreme heat and fire danger. All of those factors played into the lower than expected volunteer numbers, but I think there is work we can do next year to regularly check in with volunteers and try to close that gap. And finally, despite the numerous videos on how to use the technology in several Zoom sessions to teach and demo the apps, there were still issues with using and understanding how to use some of the technology. We are looking at ways to improve the communication next year. And one idea we had might be to hold monthly Zoom sessions where one of the stewardship team will answer any questions that come up. And I think part of the issue is volunteers just want that face-to-face -face time and a chance to interact with us as staff members. So now that we're in the planning phase for 2022, we are looking at bringing back some of our group stewardship trips. But this ISP program will play an important role in helping us diversify the type of stewardship opportunities available and help us complete lots of important work on the ground. So you can find out more about our program at onda.org backslash independent stewards, and you're welcome to email me with any questions you might have. Um, so now I'll turn it back to Randy. I think we'll have time for some questions. Thank you, Renee. Wow, three really inspirational and, and high-level detail uh, uh, stories. Let's get straight to the q and I'm going to pull in Ann Sense, who's also a fellow board member with NWSA and works with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And I'll pitch the first one, and, and, and Ann and I will switch off. But Stefan Wood, I guess this is directed to, to Peggy and Kale, asked really in a nutshell about uh, you know, the, the data monitoring, the standard minimum protocols, and how were you able to ensure the agencies that your volunteers were properly trained uh, and, and following those protocols? And I think that Stephen um, called out the solitude monitoring in particular, and we worked really closely with the wilderness managers from both the Bridger Teton National Forest and the Caribou Targhee National Forest to create a training and train the trainer trainings that would empower these volunteers with the need to know information. And we also built out a data collection sheet that had kind of built in control. So people had to be out between like, you know, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. and they had to be out for four hours. So we built in kind of just data entry that would ensure that they were hitting these kind of baseline needs to ensure their data was relevant to the project. Awesome, thank you. And moving on to the next question. So this is another one for Peggy. Um, was the campsite inventory the initial survey for this area or were you revisiting sites that had been previously surveyed? Um, and if it was that latter, did your volunteers have issues locating or differentiating between different sites? 
And this is actually um, over to Kale. So Kale, take it away. No. Yeah, I'll take it away. And that's a great question. So yes, we were revisiting sites. So um, there's data from like the late 80s that was one color dot on our collector app. And then 2011 was a different color. And then we were going out and finding these sites. And to answer your question, yes, there is some difficulty as you're trying to like get the satellite to engage with your app. And they gave us a, like a 30 foot buffer. And if you were at least in that area, you could kind of tell maybe where the campsite was. Um, but when we would you know, click it and it would connect with your satellite and then your dot would be there, when I would go back and look, our dots sometimes were overlapped. So it wasn't exactly perfect, but it was pretty close. And um, it seemed that within that 30 foot kind of radius or, you know, trial and error, we were able to locate those. But that kind of gave us that information that some of those places from the late 80s that were campsites, we could not find any evidence that people are camping there anymore. And those were places that were really right on the water, right on the lakes. Um, and so that's kind of that exciting, the education's working. Look, people aren't camping right on the water anymore. So that was kind of an, an exciting find by using that old data. Fantastic. And, and Sandy Screen, our, our beloved former Forest Service uh, Wilderness Program lead, asked for either speakers, uh, did all the ideas and work come organically or did you study any other stewardship groups to find good ways uh, uh, to use for your organizations? Phil, do you want to go first? Sure. That's a great question. And uh, we have so many programs that uh, it's a little bit of each for our more traditional uh trail stewardship. Uh, there's a lot of models out there. And, uh, we certainly were aware of that kind of work being done. We still looked somewhat organically at how we were going to do it, especially with regards to partnering on such a small area with two different forests and three different ranger districts. But I mean, the essential elements, the cost share agreement, uh, putting together uh, the standards is all pretty formulaic. But one of the things I'm really proud about that one is that the first step we took 11 years ago was to convene a meeting of all three district rangers, all three districts rec staffs uh, and our staff. And it was the first time that that group had actually ever met on anything, that the three district rangers had ever spoken about any issue. So it had ramifications beyond the trail work. Uh, our, our trail ambassador program, certainly one-on-one -on -one education's not uncommon, but it arose out of a specific need. And so we drew the program uh, to meet that. And uh, again, our uh, carnivore study grew out of a very specific request that uh, we grew based on capacities and it had a, its own internal feedback loop. So to a large degree, we're entering new space. And I'd like to think that with the latter two programs, the Trail Ambassador and our uh, Citizen Science, we set something of a model for other groups that are doing that kind of stuff, at least in our region. Fantastic. Renee, anything to add? I know you mentioned the Colorado uh, Mountain Club example. Uh, and we're going to hear more from them. It sounds like Randy Walsh has already set up another webinar in the very near future on that. Um, anything to add, Renee? Yeah, just uh, they definitely looked at what a lot of other groups were doing and tried to um, really go through and analyze things and how could this work and how. And this was really going also going into it with an attitude of we're trying this out. We we don't know if we will be successful, if it will be impactful, but having that sort of um, that that attitude, I think, really helped because we're all managing COVID and the pandemic in different ways. So looking, trying to learn from others, trying to adapt, trying to get creative was all part of the game. All right, and next question. Um, this is another one for the, for the panel. Um, can you all speak to how your organization's staffers are paid for their support of this program? Um, the question specifically asked Renee, you, where that money comes from um, for spreadsheet data management, things like that. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have a large membership, um, an individual giving program at Onda. So we have over, you know, I think it's over 5,000 paid members now in our organization. We also have a lot of grant foundation and grant support. Um, so yeah, a mixture of all of those avenues. Great. Mr. Walsh, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're fine on time for right now. 
We do have one question from our audience. Um, Tyler, if you are still wanting to ask a question, uh, you now have uh, permission to talk. Um, maybe he left. Okay. Um, I think there's a little question for Phil. If you'd like to answer, um, Phil, did you provide stewards any special community engagement training for the trail ambassadors? Yes, great question. So uh, we provided two levels of training for the trail ambassadors. We had the biologists come in from both the Forest Service and Idaho Department of Fish and Game and talk about goat behavior and best practices and how to communicate those things to folks effectively. And then we also provided training about how to engage the public in general. The ambassadors aren't meant to be enforcement officers, they're meant to educate. And so teaching those soft skills was really important as they interact with the public more directly than many of our other volunteer programs. And so we put them through an hour long training. We have a training video and then we're uh, also, we also send them materials and then we're available for consultation upon anything that's particularly challenging. And do you wanna ask that last one? Yeah, absolutely. And this is another one for any of the groups represented. Um, do you take on work outside of wilderness areas? And if so, what percent of that total work um, that you do in that area is it? Happy to jump in. We do work outside of wilderness areas, yes, on a lot of public lands. We work with fish and wildlife, some forest service some state lands, um, even a little bit of private. So yeah, we I don't know the percentage breakdown, but it's really, we try to look at it through the greatest ecological needs and you know conservation goals on the landscape. Yeah, that's a really good question. We stay focused on the Scotchman Peaks roadless area. Of course, we advocate for protection for the entire area. There are portions of it that aren't recommended by the Forest Service. We still see that as area that's suitable for some trail projects and for some hikes and things. And then we're pragmatists in the winter to get kids out for the winter tracks program, venues that are closer to the school that maybe aren't a three hour ski into the Scotchman's are the places we're gonna use and we're exposing them to the outdoor wilderness principles. So we still see that as an impact primarily on the proposal we have, but uh, sometimes you have to be reasonable about the education opportunities. Carol, you had something to add? Oh, I was just gonna say, yeah, we also work, um, the fence project is an example where we're on just public lands and actually some easements and, uh, but we're looking at, you know, some recommended wilderness. So almost we are on a lot of land that's just public land, do a lot of projects there. And same with what Phil just said, we, we run several outdoor clubs through high schools. And so they are utilizing a lot of just our forest and, um, but talking kind of pointing their eyes towards those wilderness areas and how to take care of them. But yeah, a lot of the groundwork ends up being outside of wilderness, especially in those other months besides summer. Fantastic. I really want to thank our panelists for what have been just three excellent presentations that are truly inspiring. Um, you probably maybe didn't see the accolades as they were pouring in after each of you gave your presentations, but there's a lots of good positive input from our audience. So I really thank you for the quality of your presentations. And I'll turn it back to Randy Welsh. All right. Well, thank you again. It was, I, I think this was a really great session. Lots of great ideas for people to learn from. Uh, Phil and Renee, if I could get you to send me your PowerPoints, we'll have those available for everybody at um, upcoming time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording for this particular